Good morning. It's Friday, the 2nd of February, and this is Govind Raj Raj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Well, the interim budget is out and our top stories and themes for the day will represent mostly that. Interim budget leans on political capital, sticks to the original strategy on an infrastructure push. The government sets aggressive fiscal deficit target of 5.1% tightened spending. Oil stays below $82 a barrel despite Joe Biden's threat to respond to Iran. And more large organizations are calling people back to work or asking them to leave. This is a core report with Govindraj Ethiraj. The interim budget leans on political capital. The interim budget on February 1st leaned heavily on the political capital that the government is enjoying by sticking to its original strategy, which included investments in infrastructure like roads and railways, affordable housing, and a tight rein on fiscal deficit and new initiatives across the renewables space. There were no major spending or tax measures, at least aimed at voters. Elsewhere on the taxation front, it took a philosophical and practical call not to go after taxpayers who have sums apparently due from 1962 or thereabouts, including below 25,000 rupees. The reason given was that all the centralization and digitization of tax records happened in 2010 and 11, and getting hold of records scattered across the country only to find that taxpayers would say they had already paid up was too cumbersome and not worth the effort. Now, the thinking here is welcome, even if the step may seem relatively small and should and therefore hopefully lead in easing up in other actions of the tax department as well. For instance, high-pitched assessments, which usually have no hope of seeing light of day and only serve to lock companies up in long litigation cases. The government says it will cut its budget deficit sharply in the coming fiscal year that begins in April, reducing it to 5.1% of gross domestic product, lower than the 5.3% predicted by economists in a Bloomberg survey. The deficit for the current year was revised down slightly to 5.8%. To put things in context, it had hit 9.2%, that's the deficit in the pandemic year. And going forward, the target in 25-26 is 4.5%. Now, the smaller than expected deficit and the cut in borrowing for the next year prompted a rally in bonds, with the yield on the benchmark 10-year bond falling as much as 11 points to 7.04% on Thursday. Gurpreet Chatwal, the managing director of Crystal Rating, said that the corporate bond market was expected to benefit from increased availability following lower than expected government bond sales by 1 lakh crore rupees next fiscal as the government seeked to rein in fiscal deficit to 5.1%. Now, this, he said, augured well also for the anticipated revival in private sector capital expenditure across sectors in the coming year. In the markets now, the BSE Sensex ended the day with a loss of 107 points at 71,645 without much action throughout the day, possibly seeking direction from the budget, which did not come and quite expectedly. The NEC Nifty 50 finished 28 points lower at 21,697. Elsewhere, Reuters reported that India's manufacturing industry improved substantially at the start of 2024, with factory activity expanding at its fastest pace in four months in January on robust demand and an upbeat year-end outlook, according to the HSBC Final India Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index, or PMI, compiled by S&P Global, which rose to 56.5% in January from December's 18-month low of 54.9%. Back to yesterday's budget, it allocated about 11 lakh crore rupees or $134 billion for capital spending, which was an increase of 11% from the previous year. The government had and has ramped up capital expenditure by almost a third annually in the past three years, as we've been pointing out here. There were no tax changes for individuals or businesses, nor were there expected to be. There were some extensions of tax holidays, and we'll come to that shortly, and elsewhere they were not, like for new manufacturing investments. Overall, India will spend about 455,000 crore rupees on subsidies for food, fertilizers and rural employment schemes in the year starting April 1st, which actually is down 7% from the current financial year, according to the documents. Fertilizer subsidies would be cut to about 164,000 crore rupees, while the allocation for food subsidies was also reduced to 205,000 crore rupees. The government says it will raise around 50,000 crores from the sale of state assets in the next fiscal year after missing this year's target. 
In general, the government seems to have gone slow on asset sales and seems quite content with the status quo. The usual argument for governments dragging their feet on asset sales is lack of political consensus, which is obviously not an issue here. Quite likely, the government is happy with the fact that several PSUs or public sector units are actually doing well, including their stock prices, and thus sidestepping the more conceptual question of why it should be owning and running businesses in the first place. As they say, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Surely in the case of disinvestment and privatization, except of course for Air India, which was a hot potato in the most literal sense and had to be dumped and was dumped. A few specific announcements which were welcomed include an increase in food storage and warehousing funds which would address perishable and post-harvest losses, which in turn has a direct impact on all the spiking prices you've seen in the last year in fruits and vegetables, including, if you can remember, and I'm sure you've not forgotten, tomatoes. Crystal says, quoting government estimates, that 6% of crops in India suffer a post-harvest loss, which translates to about 1.2 lakh crore rupees of losses. Of this, highly perishable fruits and vegetables comprise almost 50%. Hence, the increase in allocation under food storage and warehousing funds by about 17% over the fiscal 2024 should obviously do well. The renewable space, which I alluded to in the beginning, saw several announcements, including financial assistance for biomass procurement, which will provide an impetus to the growth of the biofuel sector. There will be phased mandatory blending of compressed biogas with compressed natural gas for transport and piped natural gas for domestic purpose. All of this has been mandated, which should further boost the growth of compressed biogas plants in the country. And this is something that was mentioned earlier as well. I reached out to two experts in the context of tax and the overall economy and the political economy. Budgets, of course, are political projects as well, and this perhaps more so since it comes two months ahead of a general election. So I spoke first with Ashok K. Bhattacharya, editorial director with Business Standard and columnist in the newspaper, to get a political economic temperature check. And I began by asking him how he was seeing the path as defined in the budget statements of Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman and how he was also seeing that path being carried through, in a manner of speaking, into the next financial year. There is clearly a fiscal path that has been outlined in this budget. And that fiscal path is clearly one of pursuit of fiscal prudence and consolidation. If you look at the trajectory of uh, fiscal deficit in the last few years post-COVID, you will see a gradual reduction in the government's deficit levels. And this year, it has been speeded up a bit. And next year, it is going to go down to 5.1%. Now, the important point to be noted here is that while fiscal deficit is being brought down, the challenge of government debt is uh, not being addressed uh, as well as it should have been. For example, the total government debt as a percentage of GDP is still around 58%, and it will go down to only 57%, whereas the target should have been 40%. Now, you cannot reach 40% in one year, but there is no clear trajectory that has been outlined because the government is still seeking recourse to the escape clause in the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act which allows them to deviate and not provide a medium-term framework of fiscal consolidation. So the government is sticking to a fiscal deficit path of 4.5% by 2025-26, but there is no game plan on how do you want to reduce your debt, how do you want to reduce your revenue deficit actually to zero. Right now it is at 2.8%. So I think on the one hand, fiscal deficit reduction is a clear path that one can see, direction. But on the other hand, on the debt side, on the revenue deficit side, you don't see as clear a path. And what about the path on the political economy? What are you seeing there, again, using the budget speech as a start point? From the political economy point of view, two things stand out. One is that this government has realized that pursuit of fiscal consolidation is not in conflict with pursuit of a welfareist policy, as long as there is revenue buoyancy in the economy. So it's clear that as long as revenues are doing well, the government wants to complete its welfare schemes, announce welfare schemes, transfer schemes will be given a boost, as long as the fiscal consolidation targets are met. Number two is the government is very, very clear that capital investment is something 
that is like an article of faith for this government. So even when the private sector is gradually coming into the private investment cycle, the government continues to grow its capital investment. And as a matter of fact, it will grow by 17% next year. Now, 17% growth at a time when everything else is growing by 10-12% is still a very high rate. So government is very clearly committed to the idea of boosting capital expenditure and not just this year, it will keep doing because it feels that it, it has paid its rich dividends. The third thing is, I think the government is developing a bit of cold feet on the idea of privatization. Otherwise, it could have easily laid out a path on what it wants to do with asset monetization, what it wants to do with disinvestment, and what it wants to do with privatization. And there is nothing of that sort. The definition of disinvestment, the word disinvestment doesn't figure in the budget documents. You have given a broad figure of 50,000 crore next year. So it seems the government doesn't want to get into this right now. These are the three things I would say is that direction. Right. So and the interim budget obviously uh, will not have details, let's say, on tax and spending and so on. But could there be any surprises in the July budget if assuming this government were to come back? as is being predicted? I think there is a lot that the government will do something in July on, I would say, the tax rates, particularly that affects the stock market. There is an agenda for change on the capital gains side. The government will have to tackle that issue. You will note that there was a lot of expectation from the capital market this year, even in the interim budget, on some changes in the capital gains. So I think they will be that. And of course, on the direct taxes side, there would be some expectation on a further rationalization. And hopefully, on the GST side, you will see some further rationalization, uh, reduction in the number of rates. Uh, Right now, you have got too many number of rates in GST. One more thing I would like to say is uh, the manner in which the interim budget numbers have shown the way center is transferring resources to the states is a relatively new development. In the last three years, the center has transferred more resources to the states than it has done in the recent past. Now, it is true that some states may have gained more than other states, but the fact that apart from the devolution transfer, uh, the tax devolution transfer under the Finance Commission uh, dictate, even the central transfer of money to the states have gone up. Now, that is a development that one must take note of because uh, this is fiscal federalism with a political intent in mind, it seems to me, because not every state is benefiting out of this. Uh, Some states are benefiting more than some other states. So one has to look into the data, how which states have benefited more. But the fact that the center is giving more money to the states in a federal country like ours is a very important development from a political economy perspective. Right. Uh, AKB, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I also spoke with Mukesh Bhutani, managing partner at BMR Legal, a leading tax and legal consulting firm. And I began by asking him what he was seeing from the budget in a directional sense before getting down to the specifics. Let's take fiscal responsibility and budget management legislation, which was passed by the parliament in 2004, which kind of thrust upon the members of parliament a responsibility to present a statement. And we've seen slippages happening for uh, situations which were largely black swan, whether it's a 2008 financial crisis or it's the COVID of 2000, where the government allowed the slippages that have happened. And then it has resulted in correction. So if I just look at this year's budget, 5.8%, which is the advanced estimate for fiscal deficit, it's unprecedented for two reasons. Number one, where did we stand at the end of the COVID fiscal year 2021 and where do we stand in 24 is one big change. The consolidation has happened. I remember still three years back when she laid down a four-year target of achieving 4.5% fiscal deficit for 26-27. Most people felt that sounds like, looks like a mirage and she'll not be able to achieve it. It's still ambitious to go from 5.8 to 5.1 and 5.1 to 4.5. But I think it gives her the confidence for two, three reasons. In five out of her six budgets, she has over-delivered on tax collection, number one, other than the COVID year. And in COVID year, you never expected for your tax collections to be on target. 
Two, she'd been able to achieve an unprecedented Bernsey in tax collection. And for the first time we have seen in fiscal year 23-24, she's firing 8 to 10 cylinders on both GST as well as on direct taxes. So I think this gives a confidence for her to say she will be able to not just achieve the fiscal deficit, which is revenue driven, but she also is not curtailing the expenditure. Historically, and the build up to say the budget of 2008, when Mr. Chidambaram was able to achieve phenomenal success on fiscal deficit and 2007 was the lowest that he was able to achieve. That was driven more by revenue mobilization because expenditure curtailment was not a strategy in a coalition government. Here, what she's been able to do is that she's saying, I'm not just spending, but I'm spending a whole lot of capital expenditure. I have been able to control you know, my capital expenditure basket is very different than what it was historically, wherein you had pensions, interest payouts for public borrowings, market borrowings, so on and so forth. So this, I think, is a watershed year if you look at the fiscal discipline target. And in my view, I would attribute this as a golden era from a fiscal prudence standpoint. Got it. So does that mean that they could be easing off on other things? For example, if I were to take a small example, they've said that there are certain tax demands that are not going to be now pursued. I mean, these are very small, less than 25,000, less than 15,000. So is that an indicator of that confidence or is this more a tax administration approach? No, I think that message is very different. I would not be surprised. And I was talking to one of the retired revenue services officials and he said that, Mukesh, there are many demands where the department doesn't even have a track record, but it features in the books of the department as a money that the taxpayer owes you. He also said that there are other demands which may be genuine, but the kind of effort the administration has to put to be able to recover it is disproportionate to what we'll recover. So we are cleaning up our books. And she actually quantified in the interim budget earlier today, how much does that mean by way of a giveaway? I think it makes a whole lot of sense because then the focus of the administration, particularly in era where for the last four to five years, government has pursued a very aggressive tax digitalization program makes sense. Because bear in mind, Govin, all of these are non-digitalized records. So I think what she's trying to say is that I'm continuing with my messages that I have sent out in the last four years, starting from the settlement of cases for excise duty, and then we had the Kar Vivad Samadhan scheme of 2019, clean up all the areas, give an opportunity to the taxpayer to settle the tax dues. So this is another modification of that message that she's trying to deliver. And, you know, she's trying to kill two, three birds with the same stone. She's trying to focus the administration's responsibility on large taxpayers. She's trying to clean up her books. And she's also trying to send a message that I believe in, you know, settling disputes outside of the court system and outside of the normal dispute resolution process. Right. So now what were the specific areas that are either giveaways or let's say not giveaways? You know, for example, let's say extending a tax holiday is one kind of, I don't know if giveaway is the right word here, but is an extension. So is there anything that, yeah? Yes, it is correct. It is a giveaway if you look at it from the point of view of the balance sheet of the country because you're giving away the right to tax which otherwise you would have taxed or you're giving away part of the right by offering a concession. But these three specific extensions that she has given was largely overdue. Startups, gift city and sovereign wealth funds. So if you recall, all of these measures were bought in either to encourage investments coming in from sovereign governments or to encourage investments coming into the gift city or to encourage the overall ecosystem for the startups. These were all statutorily expiring on March 31. And we know that we will not see the finance bill 2 of 2024 up until July. So in order to give certainty for taxpayers from April 1, she said that I'm extending it by one year. Number one. I think if you follow the same principle, ideally, there is one more incentive, which was for new manufacturing, the 15% tax rate. That is also expiring on March 31. That was the expectation. Exactly. Because now what happens to new manufacturing? Suppose somebody wants to put up a unit on April 1. Or, you know, what does he do? Does he get a tax holiday? Doesn't get a tax holiday? There's uncertainty. I felt that the same logic applied for 
extending the 15% tax holiday for manufacturing as well, particularly since there is a whole lot of thrust directionally by the government, not just in this year's budget, but in the past non-fiscal incentive scheme as well on make in India, domestic manufacturing, so on and so forth. And people couldn't really use it because of COVID. Some people used it, but the large manufacturing is was still anticipating that it will happen. That still does not mean, Govind, that you can't present a finance bill in July to make the 15% tax it applicable retrospectively from April 1. But I thought that that would have been a good measure and also aligned to what she extended it by one more year. Right. And lastly, anything for individuals in this whole thing, Mukesh? Well, there was wide anticipation that the marginalized taxpayers would get some benefit. The confusion on the two schemes that the government has been playing around between 22 and 23 budget would be clarified. But nothing as such. But again, this is something that can be changed in July as well. I think the larger messaging was that just because this is an election year and conventionally politicians are used to freebies and giveaways, you know, I'm different. I think that's the larger message that she's trying to convey. Right. I guess hints of that have been already presented. So, right. Mukesh, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure talking to you always. Among other economy news, India's leading car makers have reported their best ever monthly sales with volumes growing 13% to about 400,000 units, according to the Economic Times. A senior Maruti Suzuki official told the Economic Times that industry stocks were low at the start of the month, which prompted dealers to restock. While demand parameters were stable, the direction would become clearer February onwards. And we at The Core Report would, of course, be also waiting for numbers from the Federation of Automotive Dealers Association, which usually tends to provide a more on-ground understanding and perspective. So hang on for that. Meanwhile, oil prices are hanging on too, as tensions in the Middle East have not yet ceased. But Brent crude prices are still holding below $82 a barrel at around $81 a barrel and 35 cents. Prices have stayed down after data showed increasing U.S. crude stockpiles and rising oil output. President Joe Biden said earlier this week that he had made a decision on how to respond to an attack over the weekend that killed American troops in Jordan without providing details. He said that Iran was responsible for providing the weaponry used in the strike, though Tehran has denied involvement and vowed to hit back against any strike on its soil or assets abroad. Bloomberg said that the United States oil output rose to about 13.3 million barrels a day in November, surpassing a previous record in September, according to the Energy Information Administration. And data also showed weekly production back at 13 million barrels a day, while crude inventories have gained for the first time in three weeks. All of this was part of our energy segment supported by India Energy Week to be held from February 6th in Goa. For more details, do log on to www.indiaenergyweek.com. Interest rate cuts seem some time away. The dollar index is hovering a near one and a half month high as Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said it's unlikely that the central bank will start cutting interest rates in March. Investors are now expecting only 34% odds for a March rate cut and the inflation rate in the euro area went down to 2.8% year-on-year in January 2024 from 2.9% in the previous month. Gold prices are also trading lower, linked somewhat to the dollar factor. More large companies are calling employees back. UPS The delivery company on Tuesday joined a small group of large companies pushing for a return to what has now become an anomaly in American work life five days in the office, said the Wall Street Journal. The delivery giant followed JP Morgan Chase and Boeing among employers requiring full-time attendance for at least some segment of their workforces. And aside, I'm not sure I want to fly in an aircraft now that I know it, produced by people sitting at home. Just saying, and please don't jump on me. In the United Kingdom, Ernst & Young is monitoring staff attendance in the office as workers break its hybrid working rule policies. The big four accountancy firm has apparently begun using anonymized turnstile data to assess compliance with its hybrid working policy, the Financial Times reported. IBM has asked all its US managers to return to the office or leave the job, according to a Bloomberg report. In a memo dated Jan 16th, a senior IBM official said that all managers based in the United States must now report to an office or client location for a minimum of three days each week, irrespective of their current work arrangement. 
And guess which organization has a zero work from home policy, flexibility, which is zero, and folks working there can't even dream about it? Well, it's the government of India. And that's been the situation even during some of the worst days of the pandemic. I'd love to spend some more time on this, including some other Indian companies, but not today. Meanwhile, think about it. That's it for me for today. Have a great weekend and see you Monday. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopses or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening. <laughs>